in my last episode of recent reads it seemed like all of the good books had just congregated this one will be slightly different unfortunately don't have as high a rate of success and this video is in the last one so we're gonna have some more salty reviews <laughs> I don't know if that's fun for you. The first book I read was a book of poetry, Pelican by Emily O'Neill. I did not dislike this. This was a solid book of poetry. Um, for me, I didn't have like profound thoughts on it. I felt like, you know, a lot of the themes in here are fairly common themes in poetry. You know, like loss or self, but I thought that there were a lot of just like clean imagery and it was still, you know, written with enough kind of uh, humanity from the author that I still found quite a lot of the poems um, resonated with me. I tabbed a good number. However, there were also a lot of poems that just didn't really click with me that I didn't get much out of. So this was a solid read. It's pretty accessible too, I think. So maybe a good one if you're just getting into poetry. Then I read a novel, What We Lose by Zinzi Clemens. So this, unfortunately, wasn't my favorite. This is a novel that follows a young woman after her mother passes away from cancer, and we follow, follow her in different timelines of her life in very short, like, vignette-style chapters. All of the chapters are as short as, like, a paragraph or even shorter to maybe a page or two. So it's a lot of just little vignettes. It's kind of similar to Rue by Kim Thoy, which I really enjoyed that book. This one, it unfortunately just didn't work as well here for me. Like the writing is good and clear and concise. Individually, the vignettes, most of them didn't leave a huge impression on me. I felt like a lot of them felt like they were kind of expressing something that I'd seen before or read before or felt before, but not in a way where it was like, oh, like that feels accurate. It was kind of just like a bit, the sentiment was a bit familiar or the way the sentiment was expressed was a bit familiar. Most of them didn't resonate with me individually and they also didn't really cohesively come together to create something kind of greater than the sum of their parts, unfortunately. I feel like in order to write a book with this kind of style, your individual vignettes need to possess a lot of insight and I just didn't really get that here. If you're writing this kind of book, ideally by the end, even though there's not a clear linear narrative, you wanna feel like you've really come to know the character through all these fragments. And I didn't really feel like I understood her that much better than at the beginning. So then I read a short story collection, The Dead Husband Project by Sarah May Hansirk. This was kind of just like a middle range, solid three star collection for me in that it's well written. I thought the writing was really interesting. The stories, a lot of them had really interesting concepts. But the stories I really liked and the rest of them were kind of just like a bit average in that I didn't dislike them, but I didn't necessarily feel like I took that much away from them. Some of the stories in here are really bizarre and I think the ones that towed the line between reality and surrealism or just really bizarre ones. I thought those were the strongest. It's been like maybe a month or two since I read this or maybe two months since I read this and I've honestly kind of forgotten all of the stories by now. They kind of just all blurred together. <laughs> then I read our 2018 Man Booker Prize winner, Milkman by Anna Byrne, which you would think would be excellent because it won the Man Booker. I felt about exactly about this, how I felt about the previous Man Booker winner, which was Lincoln and the Bardo, which was very cleverly written, very hard to read. I often have good luck with Man Booker shortlist novels. Man Booker winners? It seems less so. So this novel is set in Northern Ireland during the Troubles, and we follow this young woman who's only referred to as middle sister. All of the characters in here are not referred to as their names. So this guy that she kind of has a thing with is called Maybe Boyfriend. Her other siblings are referred to as kind of where they are in the family, like middle sister or eldest sister or whatever. Um, there's a character called Somebody McSomebody, and then there's also this character called the Milkman. What happens is she has these few very weird encounters with this character called the Milkman. As a result, um, a lot of very dangerously implicated gossip starts to be spread around her when people think that she's having an affair with him. She's like 18. It's first person retrospective. I picked this up because I went to Belfast earlier this summer, spring. It was spring. It was April. <laughs> Time flies. I really like reading books about places I've been to. If I travel somewhere, I really like to read a book set there. And so when I saw that this was set in Northern Ireland, I was like, I've been to Northern Ireland. I have very mixed feelings about this novel because I feel like there is so much to admire. The main character is a character I've never seen before, which is like 
Criteria number one for an excellent novel, in my opinion, is a really interesting main character. Really interesting main character. The series of events is really interesting. The voice is where I have mixed feelings because the writing staff clearly had a lot of thought and care put into it. It's basically a stream of consciousness, but it's so dense. So we're dealing with basically every single page looks like this. No paragraphs. All of the dialogue is smushed together. It really is meant to accurately fully reflect her way of thinking. This character, she is so interesting, but at the same time, we'll be like in the middle of the scene and then she'll fly off for four pages. And like, these are long pages. Like, this isn't four pages, this is like four pages. She'll fly off for four or more pages on a series of unconnected tangents. And then eventually we'll come back to the scene and I'll be like, oh my god, I forgot that something was actually happening. Like, most of this book is tangential. Very few things actually happen. Most of it is just her going off in her brain. It's very easy to lose track of where you are. The writing itself is very dense. It moves so slowly. This is the kind of book that where I was reading, I would have to set like page count goals. I would have to be like, I'm going to sit down and read 40 pages because if I didn't, I would have never finished the book. So in a way, I really admire the voice because I think the language is so interesting and line by line, it's wonderful. It's, it's clever, it's eccentric. So it's one of those books where like, I would rate it very highly in terms of plot and character and skill, but very low in terms of readability. Then I read Home Fire by Camilla Shamsley. This novel follows these three siblings and kind of the burden of a legacy that they carry from their jihadist father and how their bonds are tested amongst themselves and amongst others when they're thrown into this kind of international spotlight scandal. I had mixed feelings about this. At the start, this novel really didn't do much for me. We start, every single section is a different character's point of view and I don't know, there's maybe six, seven sections. We start with Isma and her point of view just did not grab me. I was like, what? Nothing is happening. This isn't a story yet. And then we get to the next perspective and it's like, we could have completely not had the first one. Like the first chunk of this book was literally just to introduce a character. The opening section just seemed so inconsequential and so I was really like going into the next section I was like I'm not that interested in this storyline because there isn't really a storyline happening right now. As the book went on I got more and more interested. The stakes started to really rise. Um, it started to become a very exciting plot line. I thought that this was going to be- I didn't really know what this was about going into it because the plot summary is quite vague. So I really thought this was going to be more of a quieter family saga and then it started to get into like this big international scandal and I was like, whoa, I wasn't expecting this. So the stakes really shot up very fast and it became more exciting. But I just never really left much of an impression on me. Only one of the characters, and that was Anika, felt really developed and interesting and clear on the page. The others, I just never really felt like they were that deep. And so as a result, this really just didn't leave much of an impression on me. Like it just felt like kind of a, oh, I feel bad. It seems like a mean thing to say, kind of a forgettable novel. This book, and maybe this isn't fair to say because maybe this is just me going, if this were my book, I would have written it like this. But I think that the relationship between Parvez and Anika was by far the most interesting aspect of the book. And I think that if the book had kind of fully been rooted in their points of view, much more narrowly focused on just their relationship and not kind of the more superficial like I think it would have been quite a strong novel because I think that that relationship was actually very interesting and those two characters were quite interesting but everything else kind of padding that relationship in those two characters just felt kind of like it just it either felt kind of inconsequential or kind of sensationalized in a way that I didn't really connect with. So this next book I would say is probably my favorite of all of them in the video and it's Pretend I'm Dead by Jen Began. This is a novel that follows this young woman named Mona. She's a cleaning lady. She's been a cleaning lady her, her entire life. She's kind of a disgruntled, <laughs> offbeat, kind of unlikable young woman which is why I loved her. <laughs> she has this relationship with this man who she only refers to in the narrative as Mr. Disgusting. Near the end of their relationship he says to her like you should just go restart. Like you should move to this weird place in New Mexico and you should restart. And so after their relationship ends she feels like she decides to do that. So we follow her kind of restarting her life in this weird town in New Mexico and just the weird interactions she has with some of the people around her. What I loved most was Mona. One of the things I value most in a book is just a really interesting perspective and a really interesting main character. When I read a book and I feel like the main character is one I've seen before and they're just not very vibrant, I'm like, 
why am I reading the story? Like, I really want to read a perspective that someone I've never encountered before. I feel like a protagonist should earn being a protagonist by being a character we've not seen before. And Mona definitely was that. And I, I liked that I felt like the author wasn't afraid to just make her quirky and weird and unlikable. She's not a nice person. She's not a good person. She's not a terrible person. I just felt like she was written with this kind of like honesty and all of her flaws that are very plain made her so interesting. I really love really flawed characters who might be unlikable people, but make really likable characters. So she was a really great narrator. Her perspective was so interesting. I really admired like the sarcasm. It's very darkly comic. I found it quite funny at points. My only issue was that it kind of felt a little episodic. Like there aren't many chapters. There's a few sections and each one kind of just centers around her relationship or interaction with another person. So you know, we see her Mr. Disgusting in the first one and then we see her new neighbors and then we see who are weird and then we see this guy that she cleans for and then we see this other woman that she cleans for and I just felt like none of those conflicts ever got any kind of resolution and I don't believe a novel needs a closed ending but it kind of just felt like we were in the middle of each of these arcs and then we just left and went to the next one. I really liked this book so this isn't a huge quibble but it's like the only one I had so I'm talking about it. It didn't feel realistic because it was like we've left this little section but does she never encounter this person again? Like these people are her neighbors. We never got resolution to this relationship she had with them. Did she just never speak to them again? It was slightly unsatisfying. I still really, really enjoyed this. Didn't I couldn't put it down. I read this in like two days. Then we have Human Acts by Han Kang. This is a novel that basically follows the aftermath of a student uprising in South Korea and this young boy is killed and we kind of just explore the aftermath of his death. This book is weird. It's super weird. Hong Kang weirds it up in her work. I admire, I respect. All of the different sections are in different point of views. Some are in second person. One of them follows the point of view of like a recently dead soul. And it's like a soul that's like in a pile of the bodies, like in a pile of bodies. It's wild. This book is very gruesome. There's a lot of like really gruesome, gory stuff. So I really liked the playfulness of the form. It's weird to call this book playful because it's quite dark but it just was so inventive formally, which I thought was really cool. The only thing was I just never really felt like that connected to the storyline or the characters or like it really was that cohesive. Like the thread is this boy's death. And that should be enough, I feel like, to tie it together, but I just didn't feel like it was. Maybe just because I didn't feel like I ever really got emotionally invested in really any of the point of views. <laughs> Next up is a book that I have some hot takes on. So go make yourself some tea, come back. I have some stuff to dish. <laughs> so the next book that I read is Putney by Sofka Zinoviev. I went into this expecting it to be a controversial novel. This is a novel about the relationship between this girl who is like 13 and a grown man. And the story is kind of looking back on this relationship and seeing how it affected her as an adult. So obviously anytime a book is literally about pedophilia, it's going to be controversial and that's why I picked this up because as a writer I wanted to see how another writer handled maybe the most controversial subject matter that there is. I don't intend on writing about pedophilia. It wasn't the specific topic. I just wanted to see how an author would handle something really sensitive. And unfortunately the answer here was not that well but it's not for the reasons you might expect. It's not that I thought the book was insensitive. I kind of felt like the author and again I don't want to project onto the author because I don't know what she was thinking. Maybe this isn't what she was thinking. This is just the vibe I got because while I was reading this I kind of felt like I had the, the author's presence was way too strong and that I felt like she was constantly or the author was constantly there trying to remind me that what was happening in the book wasn't okay. It felt like all of the character complexity just got sucked away because it felt like the narrative itself was constantly stating, by the way, this is wrong. When it just didn't feel realistic, it felt like the characters just became mouthpieces for ethics. I think what bothered me about it was that this book is constantly trying to remind me that statutory rape is wrong. I know. At first I just thought it was kind of weird, but eventually it started to annoy me because I was like, I literally feel like the author doesn't trust me to know that statutory rape is wrong. Like, I know that. I'm not reading this like, oh, this is totally fine. Everything is fine. No, I'm reading this and like, even without being told, I can tell that this is abuse. 
And there's one character in the book, Jane, who's kind of like the witness. She's a friend of the young girl, Daphne. She literally just felt like she was there to be basically be a cheerleader at the point in the book before Daphne had realized that what had happened in her childhood was abuse. Because basically, we see this relationship unfold when in the past, and then we also see them in the present, like quite a bit later. Daphne is like, doesn't really think that the relationship we had, she had with this man, Ralph, was wrong or anything. And so it felt like at that point in the book, there was this character, Jane, and all she did was basically just be like, this is wrong, this isn't okay, report him to the police. She had no complexity, she wasn't doing anything. She literally felt like a safeguard. She felt like she was just safeguarding so that no one could possibly think that the author condoned what was happening. Like, I kind of just felt like the author was so worried that people would think she was condoning the subject matter that she just had constant safeguards explicitly stating that what was happening was wrong and it made the characters feel really flat because it was like they were just so overtly aware of the ethics of their situation and instead of being complex people with like complex emotional responses to things they were just reduced to kind of safeguarding the own the storyline there was a good takeaway like i read this to see how an author would handle something really sensitive i wasn't expecting it to be handled this way it kind of made me realize that sometimes over being overly cautious can be just just as weak a way to represent a topic as not being cautious at all because i just felt like there was absolutely no faith in the reader and most of all i felt like it kind of felt like the author was scared to write the book and she was scared of how people would react to it which i understand but I don't know, it's just so authorial. I'm gonna stop rambling now. I'm just circling the same point over and over again. The writing itself was pretty good. I thought there was some pretty good prose and sense of place and time. Then I read another book of poetry, Girls Are Coming Out of the Woods by Tishani Dashi. This is a book of poetry that really explores like womanhood, cultural identity, body, violence, and a lot of the time with like a mythological kind of take. So this seemed like right up my alley. This seemed like everything I would like. And I enjoyed it, but I just, I guess, didn't resonate with it super fully. It was interesting subject matter and interesting language. I kind of just felt like it was not super accessible. And like, I don't want to make it seem like I think it should be dumbed down or anything. Because this, I admire like the language and everything. I think it was more like emotionally inaccessible. Like I felt like I wasn't really fully just given emotional access to a lot of the feelings. I don't really know how to describe that or why, that's just kind of how I felt while reading it, but I still enjoyed this and I do really admire a lot of the language and like the structures of the poems and everything. And there were a few pieces that were um, quite highlight pieces. So the final book that I read is one that had been recommended to me so many times and it's Everything Here is Beautiful by Mira T. Lee. This is one of my other favorites from this video along with Pretend I'm Dead. Um, this is a novel that follows these two sisters, Lucia and Miranda, and we follow them over a long period of time and kind of their relationship and how it evolves um, in response to Lucia's mental illness. I think it's schizophrenia that she's diagnosed with, though. They don't name it that often, but like it, she has some kind of psychotic disorder. This is a really well-written novel with really well-drawn characters. Overall, I really enjoyed this. There isn't a strong, like a strong or fast-moving plot. It's very character-driven, and the characters are quite real and human, um, so it works quite well. Overall, I really enjoyed this. I felt like I was really given access to kind of like the feelings and just evolution of this family. Really, my only quibble was that I felt like Miranda kind of faded into the background. As the book went on, the book just revolved so much about Lucia. And I felt like for a book that is marketed and seems like it's supposed to be about the bond between two sisters, it really started to feel more like just a book about Lucia. Miranda was kind of a complex character at the start, but I felt like she was actually the weakest character in the novel because by the end, I felt like all she did was berate Lucia to take her medication. She was never not doing anything except worrying about Lucia or berating her to take her medication. And I understand, like, I understand why she would do those things, but I just felt like there was nothing else to her. Like, we lost other aspects of her by the end. So she kind of thinned a bit as a character, but everyone else stayed quite complex. Lucia is a character I will not be forgetting anytime soon. 
and a lot of the other characters as well. Really complex, interesting relationships. Definitely just a really great novel. Very polished, cleanly written, clearly very well researched, and everything I just thought felt very and just genuine, you know? Like, I never felt like, oh, I'm reading a story right now. I felt like I was just seeing actual people's lives. So, excellent. So those are the last 10 books that I read. Uh, thank you guys so much for watching. As always, let me know if there's anything you've read recently that you would recommend. If you have any questions, you can always send me an ask on Tumblr, and I'll see you in another video.